So the channel has been getting a bit heavy lately, so for this video I thought I would do something lighter and make some fun animations involving gears. However, it occurs to me that typically when you see drawings of gears, you'll notice that they're not drawn in a way that an engineer might draw them. In other words, they don't mesh perfectly, and you can easily see that if you were to actually make gears this way, you know, there'd be a lot of clanging and there would not be a smooth transfer of motion from one gear to another. Now I do understand that a lot of times this is just an aesthetic or an artistic choice, and if that's true, that is perfectly fine. But let me show you how to do it the more satisfying way. First, imagine you are unlooping string from a roll tautly. Then the curve that the tip of the string will trace out is called an involute. Now, we are interested in involutes because you can use them to draw perfectly meshing gear teeth. So let's say you start with two gears of two different sizes and you don't know how to draw the teeth on them yet. Then what I want you to do is draw evenly spaced involutes coming off of the first gear, just depending on however many teeth you want, and then do the same thing coming again off of the second gear. And then repeat the process, except this time flip the string and also move your starting positions depending on however wide you want your gear teeth to be. Now using involutes for gear teeth profiles is advantageous, not only because there is a smooth transfer of motion from one gear to another, but you'll notice the angle at which pressure is being applied from one gear to another stays constant, and the point at which pressure is being applied moves at a constant speed, which results in a situation where there's no sort of unpredictable stress that is going from one gear to the other, and so you'll see this methodology of gear construction pop up everywhere, even in places where you would least expect it to. You may have noticed that with this method, the length of the gear teeth as well as the angle at which pressure is being applied is completely determined by how far apart I put my gears, which can at times result in some awkward looking gears. Now you can rectify this situation by keeping the involute shapes but just elongating the gears at the base, which is perfectly fine but can at times result in a situation where you have the tip of one gear tooth cut into the base of another gear tooth, resulting in what are called undercuts. Now, just a few practical notes. Number one, really big undercuts are undesirable because they weaken the gear teeth. Number two, you don't want gears with very few teeth because there's no guarantee that the next tooth will engage before the previous one is done. And number three, you might want to add some tolerances just so that there's a little bit of breathing room for your gears. However, since I'm just drawing pictures, you know, I'm not actually making any gears, I'm not going to worry about any of this stuff. Now, even with just two gears, you know, no bells and whistles or anything, it is just so much fun to watch them fit together as they rotate. Now that we have this stuff in hand, I really wanted to combine it with some other beautiful mathematics, and I think we're finally ready. So today we'll be taking ideas from an artist named M.C. Escher. Why Escher? Well, so mathematicians and artists have their own conceptions of what makes things beautiful, but very rarely do you find an artist that works in the intersection. In other words, an artist that produces content that both parties find intellectually satisfying and meaningful. Or said another way, what's interesting about Escher's work is that there's either a deep mathematical concept or a fun math problem that underlies so much of it. And this is true despite the fact that the man had no mathematical training whatsoever. Now how does that work? I don't really know, but that should not stop us from having some fun with it. Okay, so this is the first piece we're going to carefully think about. Uh, feel free to pause if you'd like to look at it more carefully. So there's this really interesting pattern where this person is looking at a picture, and if you go all the way around, you'll find that he's also a part of that picture somehow. 
Now this effect has been dissected and interpreted to oblivion, and I'm sure you've seen similar paradoxical seeming artwork online. In fact, two Dutch mathematicians were able to work this out carefully enough where they were not only able to fill in that gap in the original picture, but reverse the transformation to produce the original drawing. Now I'll link to the paper down below in case you want to read it, but it turns out the idea is really not that complicated. So I'm going to give you a simple explanation of it and then use it on some gears. Okay, so start with some picture. Now we need to transform this picture. And to make things easier for now, let's focus on what the transformation will do to the pixels in this circle centered at the origin. So the transformation is to send every point to a new point where the Y value is the angle that the point makes with the origin and the X axis. And the X value is the log of the distance to the origin. Now, this may look complicated, but notice that it will send this circle to a vertical line segment. Now, this is true for every circle centered at the origin. They will all get sent to vertical line segments. So the region between two circles will get sent to a rectangle. Also, notice that this transformation is reversible. So you can take this rectangle and send it back to the region between two circles. Obviously, this is not too exciting, but what you can do is rotate and rescale the rectangle so that the diagonal is now vertical and has a height of 360. So that now the diagonal gets sent to a circle. Now, if you do this before you reverse, you will get logarithmic spirals, like the kind that you see on Nautilus shells or tropical storms. Now, all you have to do is tile the rectangles and you will fill out the plane with spirals. And there you have it. This is how you take a picture, isolate the region between two circles, and then use this information to create a new picture with a spiraling pattern. Just as an aside, it made sense to use the region between two circles in this picture, but you don't have to. So for example, if I hand you something like this, you aren't going to want to use circles, you're probably going to want to use the region between these two triangles. And you can. Just perform the transformation like you did before, and you won't get a rectangle, you'll, you'll get this goofy looking thing. And you may have to be slightly more careful, but just tile and tilt before reversing, similar to how we did before, and once again, you will get pretty spirally pictures. Now, moving back to gears, the process I just described is what I used to get this picture. Now, I think this looks pretty cool. However, we can go further. So take a look at these other two pieces by Escher, and you know, once again, feel free to pause if you'd like to. Well, it turns out with all the work we've already done, it's not too hard to replicate this effect as well. So start by taking the picture we've already made and put it on a plane. Then place a sphere right on top of the picture at the origin. Then the first thing we are going to do is transfer our picture onto the sphere using a method called stereographic projection. So for any point on the plane, you can draw from it a line segment to the North Pole. And if you do this, it will go through one point on the sphere. And the way you do the transfer of the image is you color the point on the sphere the same way the point on the plane was colored. And if you do this for every single point, you'll transfer the whole image onto the sphere. Notice, by the way, that this is a two-way street. You can and use this method to transfer an image from a plane onto a sphere, but also from a sphere back onto a plane, which is precisely what we are going to do. Except before doing the transfer back, we are going to rotate the sphere first. And there you have it, two spirals. Now, obviously we are not done yet because the whole point of doing this with gears is that gears are a lot of fun to watch when you rotate them. So to put the cherry on top, that is exactly what we are going to do now. Now, I think this is pretty amazing, and I have to say every time I look at it, I'm filled with a mixture of confusion and amusement. You can also do the same thing, but with smaller gears, which would result in this picture. And just for kicks, uh, here's everything put together in one animation.
Now this is all very interesting, but one of the best things about digging deeper and understanding how something works is that you can use that understanding to take things to the next level, which is precisely what we are going to do now using some complex numbers. Actually, for those of you in the know, I'm sure you've noticed that there's been a strong undercurrent of complex numbers that has been running throughout this video. Those transformations from earlier, I could have just as easily described them with concepts like the complex logarithm and complex exponentiation. And even that transformation where I transferred the picture from a plane to a sphere and then back onto a plane after rotating it could just as easily have been described using this complex function. Now, I'm not going to get into the details details here because that is not what this video is about. However, there is one thing I would like to point out. If you've ever seen a plot of this function on the real line, you will have noticed that it has a zero at one and an asymptote at minus one. Well, one interesting way to think about this image is that it's kind of similar to a complex plot of this function. If you think about it, you start with a point Z and then you look at where it maps onto an image via a certain function F and then you color Z the same way. And if you think about it this way, you quickly realize that these two spirals that are happening at one and minus one are precisely a result of the fact that this function has a zero at one and goes off to infinity at minus one. Now, if you think from this perspective, you realize that taking things to the next level is just as easy as realizing that this is just one complex function. There's nothing stopping us from trying others. So let me just do one more example. So let's start with this animation, which is a bunch of three tooth gears arranged in a hexagonal pattern. And I'm going to add some color in just because that's something I haven't tried yet. Now I'm going to do everything I did earlier, except at the very end, instead of using this function, I'm going to use this one. Now this function has two points where it goes to zero and two points where it goes off to infinity. So if I understand everything correctly, I should now get four cool spirally patterns instead of just two, and indeed I do. Now I think this looks pretty amazing on its own, but once again, we can add either rotation, or motion. Now I should probably stop here because frankly there is an infinite landscape of things to try and I hope I've whet your curiosity somewhat. And if I have, please subscribe to the channel, leave a like, and maybe share this video with someone who you think might enjoy it as well. Another thing I want to mention is that I'll be putting um, versions of these animations that appeared in this video on Twitter. If you're interested, you can follow me there. Peace. Thank you.